Please open up your Bibles to the Old Testament to the book of 2 Kings. And near the very end of that book, because what we're going to be talking about and going over concerns the very end of the last kingdom that the people of Israel had. If you are familiar with the, uh, with the scriptural account, we know that after Saul and David and Solomon, the kingdom was split. It was divided. Most of the tribes, ten of them, formed what we call the northern kingdom of Israel, and only two stayed there around Jerusalem, and they were the southern kingdom of Judah. And of the two kingdoms, Judah was far more in line with what God taught. Uh, the, it, the northern kingdom of Israel never had once a, a righteous king, one who did God's will. They were all said to be wicked. They all not only involved themselves in idolatry, but encouraged the people to be involved in that. And so they were punished by God. They were carried away into captivity. And the southern kingdom of Judah lasted a while longer than them because they did have some good, righteous kings who cared about God and tried to follow Him and tried to tear down the idols. But we see they fell into the same snare. And so eventually, they fell to the same fate. And that's what we're looking at tonight. Zedekiah, the very last king to reign before the southern kingdom was finally brought to an end and carried away into captivity. We see him spoken of in 2 Kings 24, starting there with verse 17. It says, And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter the of What was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done? For because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judah that he cast them out from his presence, and Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So here's the situation that we face. Not only has the northern kingdom at this point years ago been carried away into captivity, they're already gone. And not only is the idea of captivity something that is a possibility or it's looming on the horizon, they should be already you know, smelling the blood in the water, as it were, because look at who made him king. The king of Babylon. He's not really so much a king in his own right. He's the one who's been appointed king. The Babylonians have already come and taken some people away captive. At this point, the, even the southern kingdom is what we would say a shell of its former self. This isn't the son of a king who became king when his father passed away. He's someone who is appointed as king by the ruler of Babylon. So he's more or less figurehead. We, we see how this works. That's the way kingdoms, kingdoms operated in that time. When you conquered, you would more or less leave them in charge as long as they paid you enough taxes and enough tribute. It's more, more or less the same way that corporations work today. A corporation comes in, they buy everything out, they'll appoint leaders of that company, but at the end of the day, they're all supposed to answer to this larger corporation, the one that bought them out. So here is Zedekiah. And he can say that he's, he's king of Judah, that he's, he's ruling there in Jerusalem, but he's not really in charge. He doesn't have much power to speak of. The, all the power that he has is what is allowed for him to have by the king of Babylon. And so we're going to see exactly what it was in his life that brought not only his rule, but really the entire southern kingdom crashing down. It's already in a bad state. It's already pretty bad. But we see how things go from bad to to worse because of the choices and the decisions that he made. First and foremost, we can see in his rule that it is marked by, above all else, a refusal to listen. He didn't want to hear what God was telling him. He didn't want to hear the prophecies that were being made by Jeremiah. Again, if you're familiar with the scriptures, then you know that Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet. Why is he called the, the weeping prophet? Because he lived in this day and age. He was there to see all of this happen. Here's someone who loved God, who loved the people of Israel, who didn't want them 
to be slaves, didn't want them to be carried away into some foreign land, and he's preaching time and time again to repent, to turn back to God. But they don't listen. And so he is there seeing, what we'll get to in a moment, the downfall of Jerusalem, seeing all this happen. But we see one of the things that he proclaims during this time. Over in Jeremiah chapter 27, we'll spend a good amount of time, if you haven't guessed already, in the book of Jeremiah. It says, In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus, said, thus the Lord said to me, Make yourself straps and yoke bars and put them on your neck. Send word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the sons of Ammon, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon by the hand of the envoys who have come to Jerusalem, to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them this charge for their masters. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, this is what you shall say to your masters. It is I who by my great power and my outstretched arm have made the earth with the men and animals that are on the earth, and I give it to whomever it seems right to me. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I have given him also the beasts of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. But if any nation or kingdom will not serve this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, I will punish that nation with the sword, with famine and with pestilence, declares the Lord, until I have consumed it by his hand. So do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your fortune tellers, or your sorcerers who are saying to, to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you, with the result that you will be removed far from your land, and I will drive you out, and you will perish. But any nation that will bring its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will leave on its own land to work it and dwell there, declares the Lord. So to make a long story short, Jeremiah had gone to Zedekiah and told him, You've been made king. Here is what God is telling you. You serve under Nebuchadnezzar. You put on this yoke. You answer to him. You do what you are supposed to do because it's God's will. God is the one who has put him in power. God had decreed this would happen. He, would prophet, he had already prophesied that people would be taken away, and they've seen it come to pass. They know that God says what he means, and he means what he says. He says you submit to him, and if you don't, I'm going to punish you. It'll be by Nebuchadnezzar's hand, but the punishment will be coming from God. He's warning him. You obey what he's telling you to do. I know you hate having to answer to another king because you're supposed to be a king of your own right. I know you don't like it. I know that he is, he's a, a foreigner. He's, he's, he's a non-Jew. And the law says that you're never to, to follow someone else. He says, but... I've decreed this. I'm the one who orchestrated these events. You do what he tells you to do. And if you do that, then you can stay in your land. Yeah, you'll be subject to a foreign power, but it's going to be okay. He gave him a very plain warning of what he was supposed to do. And he even told them within that message, don't listen to people who are going to try to tell you differently. Don't pay attention to what they have to say because it's a lie. But what do we see going on in the life of Zedekiah? He preferred the lie. He preferred what all these other people had to tell him. You look over in 2 Chronicles, the parallel to this. 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 36, starting there with verse 13. Speaking of Zedekiah, it says in verse 13, He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. All the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations. And they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking 
the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose up against his people until there was no remedy. Jeremiah and all the people saying, Jerusalem's going to be overthrown, saying that, that the, the kingdom's going to come to an end. They mocked them. They made fun of them. They didn't want to hear it. And we can understand why they didn't want to hear it. No one likes the bearer of bad news. But all the same, you don't shoot the messenger. And these prophets were only speaking what God had told them to say. They're not doing this because they're just trying to bring everybody down. They're not doing this to be pessimistic or to be negative. They're saying, this is what God has told me. The Lord told me to tell you this is what's going to happen if we don't repent. And no one likes to hear. You're going to have to serve under him. You're going to have to bear this yoke and submit to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, he liked the message he was getting from his own prophets. Rise up against him. You're going to be the one to over, overcome him, to overtake him. What a feather in your cap. Not only to serve in the long line of the kings of Judah, but you're going to be the one who casts off the yoke. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar came in and he carried away some of our people captive and he's the one who puts you in power and he thinks he rules over you, but you're going to topple him. You're going to bring back the kingdom to its glory days. No wonder Zedekiah liked that message. Sounds pretty good. He's going to be this hero. He's going to be the one to overcome the odds, to defy it all, to get out from under this oppressive foreign Babylonian regime. That's what he liked to hear. Just because he liked the idea of it, just because they made it sound good, because they're there cheering him on, didn't make it true. It didn't mean it was what was going to happen. And really, they should have known this because God had already told them what was going to happen. And they've seen evidence, like we said, already that God says what He means. That when God prophesies something, it comes true. They've already seen the northern kingdom taken away. They've already seen some of their people taken away. Why would you still refuse to listen? But, you know, we look back at this and we would say, how, how foolish could He be to think that He could defy God? And of course, we have the the gift of hindsight. We look back and we look at history and we question why they did what they did or how they could be so, so foolish or so reckless. But by and large, people haven't changed. We think we live in so much of a different world and a different culture and a different society. We're all the same. Human beings, by and large, are the same as they've ever been. And we see people were exactly the same in the first century, and they're exactly the same today. You look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own lusts and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. People aren't going to like it. The scripture says I have to give up this, this vice, this addiction that I have that's taking me away from God. The scriptures say I have to have self-control. I have to watch the language that I use. I can't be involved in this, this coarse, this crude jesting. People don't like that. They want to believe in God. They want a relationship with God. But when it comes to certain parts of the scripture, they're not too popular. They don't like that. So what do they do? Exactly what this passage says. They find teachers, they find preachers who will preach a message that suits them. You can find almost any denomination that's tailor-made to your own ideas of what you think life and what you think the church should be. But that doesn't make it true. And that doesn't make it right. And again, we think that we're so different today. We think that we're, we're so educated and so intelligent. And why would people follow something when they know it's, it's not true? If people want to believe something, even if they know it's not true, even when presented with evidence that these things don't stack up, they're not going to listen. They're not going to pay attention. That's why it says they wander off into myths. The things that they're following, the teachings that they have, 
have no real substance. One of the things we talked about this morning. So much of it is based on feelings and emotion, and there's no substance there. There's no depth to it. But at a certain point, people don't care. When they refuse to listen to God just because they don't like the message, they'll find something else. And there's plenty of other messages out there because Satan is good at what he does. The, the smartest, craftiest thing Satan has ever done is to decide to give us something that is close to the truth, that's almost the truth. Kind of sounds like it, sounds pretty good, but leaving out some very important details. So people believe that what they're hearing is the Bible. Well, I'm, I'm sure that's what God's Word says but they don't take the, the time to look for themselves. And when presented with Scripture that says, well, no, actually God is telling us this, are you sure? That can't be right. Because they don't want to believe it. Because the message isn't what they want to hear. They choose to listen to someone else. Ignoring all evidence to the contrary. That's exactly what Zedekiah did. He had Jeremiah, he had other prophets telling him, you need to repent telling him, if, if the people don't change, Judah's going to fall. You're going to be carried away into captivity. Telling him, you need to submit to Nebuchadnezzar. But then again, he has all these false prophets telling him, you don't have to follow Nebuchadnezzar. You don't have to listen to his rule. Why, why should you? You're a king in your own right. You're the king of Judah. You're going to overthrow him. You don't have to put up with all that. Everyone would like that kind of message. So is it any wonder who he chose to listen to. But that's not all that we see in the life of King Zedekiah. We do see, despite what you may have been led to believe up to this point, he did still believe in God. We tend to think in terms of uh, black and white that someone is either following God or they're you know, a complete atheist. No, he, he believed in the Lord. And it seems that he wanted for God to save them. He still believed that they were his chosen people and they had the special relationship with God, so, so maybe God will, will deliver us. That's what he wanted. And we see this over in Jeremiah chapter 21. It says there, starting with the first verse, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pashur, the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah the priest, the son of Messiah, saying, Inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is making war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful deeds and will make him withdraw from us. So he sends a messenger to Jeremiah, this prophet whom he's never been inclined to listen to before. He doesn't like what he has to say, but he sends a messenger. Inquire of the Lord. See if, if God will deliver us. He was hoping for some kind of miracle. Maybe he'll do this for us. He says, according to all his wonderful deeds. So Zedekiah here, he's not ignorant of what God has done. He, as a king, you'd expect him to be an educated man. He's been taught all their history. He knows about the period of the judges. He knows about David and Solomon. He knows that God has a history of being with Israel, of saving them, of helping them, that they are his people. But it seems he's probably overlooking the fact that God's deliverance always hinged upon whether or not they were faithful to the Lord. So here he is, he's asking Jeremiah, inquire of the Lord, see if he will, will help us, because I know he's a great God. He is wonderful, he is merciful, he's been with us in the past, maybe he'll be with us now. But of course the message that Jeremiah sends back is not what the king wants to hear. He tells him that Jerusalem's going to fall. That they're not going to beat Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to come in. He's going to conquer. He's going to take them all away. But here Zedekiah is, even though he hasn't been inclined to follow God's laws, to be faithful to him, he's following after idols. He is not caring what God's prophets have to say. He's still hoping, well, maybe God will save us. Maybe despite all of this, God will overlook that. Or maybe it's not that big a deal. You know, he won't care. He's God. He's got bigger, better things to worry about, maybe. All the different ways that people try to, to rationalize this and justify it in our minds. He's still hoping for a miracle. And it might come from God. Maybe God is going to 
going to do something for us. But why should God save them when they're not inclined to follow after God? In fact, it's so bad that not only did they not follow after God, is that they outright made a mockery. They made a show of following the Lord's commandments. You look over in chapter 34 of the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 34, we start with verse 8. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, male and female, so that no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. And they obeyed all the officials and all the people who had entered into the covenant that everyone would set free his slave, male or female, so that they would not be enslaved again. They obeyed and set them free. Now, what we're seeing here is part of the law. We were reading tonight in chapter 18 of Leviticus, I believe, it's chapter 25, somewhere thereabouts. A few chapters ahead, we'll get there in just a few short weeks. It describes one of the things under the law of Moses was the year of Jubilee. During that year, they were to do this. They were to set free their Hebrew slaves because they weren't to enslave their brethren for very long. You could have them as slaves, but only up to a certain point, and then you were to set them free. But keep reading at verse 11. It says there, but afterward they turned around and took back the male and female slaves they had set free and brought them into subjection as slaves. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, at the end of seven years each of you must set free the fellow Hebrew who has been sold to you and has served you six years. You must set him free from your service. But your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty each to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. But then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves whom you had set free according to their desire and you brought them into subjection to be your slaves. They acted like they were going to follow God. Well, it's the year of Jubilee. We have to set our slaves free. Well, a whole lot of good that does when you turn around and then re-enslave them. And... Not only is this horrible because he's making a show of following God. He's making it look like they're going to be faithful and they're going to do what God says. But you see the language that he uses here. It says that King Zedekiah made a covenant with the people that they would all do this. They would proclaim liberty. They would all set them free. And it's not only a covenant that he's making there with all the people. It says it's a covenant they made with God, before God. And then they turn around to do exactly the opposite. So not only is this disrespecting God, and this is disrespecting His law, flying in the face of what it says to do, but they're disrespecting just on principle the idea of what a covenant is supposed to be. A covenant is a relationship, a special contract that you have, that you make. It is a commitment. It's no different than people today who get married and then 24 or 48 hours later file for divorce. Those marriage vows you made surely meant a lot. If you're just going to turn around and throw it all away, do you even understand what a covenant is supposed to be and supposed to mean? This is what Zedekiah did. So he's hoping that God would, would save them. Well, we... we kept the year of Jubilee. No, you didn't. Not real. You made it look like you were doing this. But God sees right through that. You think He's going to be pleased just because you go through the motions? He knows you're not following His law. You don't care what He's saying. And so, at some point, it seems like 
Zedekiah must have realized it finally sinks into him that, well, God's, God's not on his side. God's not going to deliver him. After all these times where Jeremiah told him, you're not doing what's right before God. God is not pleased with you and you need to repent. After all the times he's prophesying the downfall of not only Zedekiah but of Judah. He turns to Egypt. He thinks that Egypt will, will be their, their allies. And we don't have time tonight to get into the dynamics of the relationship, but the people of Israel and the Egyptians have a very long and tumultuous history, to say the least. Obviously, we know that the Egyptians enslaved Israel so long ago, but they've been told specifically in several places not to turn to Egypt. Not to, not to seek help from Egypt. That when they were in a time of trouble, when they had armies at their gates, when, when things were looking bad, then they were to turn to the Lord. They were to trust in Him. They were to pray to Him. They were to look to God for deliverance. Don't trust in Egypt is the overall message we see repeated time and again. You might look at Egypt and say they're a mighty kingdom. Look at the army and the chariots they have. Surely they can help us. He says don't place your trust in them. But it's exactly what Zedekiah did. At some point, he clearly thought, God's not going to help us, so I'll look to Egypt for help. They're going to save us from the Babylonians because you know Nebuchadnezzar's not going to put up with a king who's constantly disrespecting him, constantly rebelling against him, not paying him the tribute that he's owed. So now you've made an enemy of Nebuchadnezzar and you're hoping that the Egyptians will save you. But you look over in Jeremiah chapter 37. It says there, starting with verse 5, it says, The army of Pharaoh had come out of Egypt. And when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard news about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus shall you say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army that came to help you is about to return to Egypt, to its own land. And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against this city. They shall capture it and burn it with fire. Thus says the Lord, Do not deceive yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans will surely go away from us, for they will not go away. For even if, you should defeat the whole army of Chaldeans who are fighting against you, and there remained of them only wounded men. Every man in his tent, they would rise up and burn this city with fire. That's pretty blunt. That's pretty harsh, the way God words this, this prophecy and this proclamation. He says, don't think that they're, that they're going to go away, that they're going to leave you alone. The, the Chaldeans, the Babylonian army, they did withdraw a little bit when the Egyptians came out. But it was only temporary. Don't think that they're going to go away. Don't think that they're going to leave you alone. He says, the armies of Egypt, they're going to go back to Egypt. They're not going to be there. They're not going to save you. And that's exactly what happened. And to take it this far, that even if you should defeat their army. Even if you were able to overcome them, if all they have are these wounded men who can't fight, they're still going to rise up. They're going to take this city. They're going to burn it with fire. Now, you read all this, this doom and gloom proclamation again. It's why Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Here he is, he's prophesying the downfall of his own people, his own kingdom. Is God happy to say this? No. No. It grieves him to say this. This is Jerusalem. This is the city of, of David. This is where the temple was. He didn't want any of this to happen. But here he is saying it's going to happen nevertheless. And there is nothing that Zedekiah or any of the people could do at this point to stop it. He says, it's too late. I've said it's going to happen. And I mean what I say, so it's going to happen. You can't stop it. Try as you might. It's not going to work. He says, they're going to take the city, they're going to burn it with fire. God's not happy to say that. He doesn't take any pleasure in that. What he's doing here is punishing the people. It's as simple as that. He had warned them, he had told them not to follow after idols, not to intermarry with the other peoples. He said, if you do that, 
I'm going to punish you. You're going to be carried away. You're going to be slaves. You're going to be captives. They didn't listen. So this is what's going to happen. Now, it was only temporary, and he even promised that, that there would be a remnant left, a remnant would come back, and we know historically that's what happened. But it doesn't change the fact that the people who are here now, this is what you're going to have to put up with. This is what's going to happen to you, and here is why. Because you, you refused to follow after God. And really, when we take all of this into consideration, that Zedekiah, he, you know, he, he didn't want to listen to God. He was still hoping for a miracle. He was hoping that things would work out. The thing is, he wanted it all on his own terms. He wanted to, to beat Nebuchadnezzar. He wanted to do it with God's help. And God says, no, well... He only wanted God's help to begin with if he wouldn't have to change his life, if he didn't have to repent, didn't have to submit to Nebuchadnezzar. And he wants to, to defeat Nebuchadnezzar with the, with the help from the Egyptians. He wants to do it the way he wants to do it. And we see, even at this point, he still thinks somehow, I guess it goes to show just how wicked he was, how far separated from God he, he was. He thought that he could manipulate Jeremiah into giving him a, a, a good report, a good prophecy. You know, that's what he wanted to hear, that you're going to win, you're going to overcome him. He didn't like the message that you need to submit. And then afterwards, the fact that, well, you're not submitting, you're rebelling against him and against God, so you're going to be taken captive and you're going to die in Babylon. We see in Jeremiah chapter 37... Jeremiah's been imprisoned. He's been thrown into the dungeons. In verse 16, it says, When Jeremiah had come to the dungeon cells and remained there many days, King Zedekiah sent for him and received him. The king questioned him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah said, There is. Then he said, You shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah also said to King Zedekiah, What wrong have I done to you or your servants or this people that you have put me in prison? Where are your prophets who prophesied to you, saying, The king of Babylon will not come against you or against this land? Now hear, please, O my lord the king, let my humble plea come before you, and do not send me back to the house of Jonathan the secretary, lest I die there. So King Zedekiah gave orders, and they committed Jeremiah to the court of the guard, and a loaf of bread was given him daily from the baker's street until all the bread of the city was gone. So Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. So he has him committed to prison, and he brings him out and says, Is there a word from the Lord? Maybe a few days in prison. That'll change his tune. Putting him on this, this diet of just bread and water. If I pressure him enough, if I put enough on him, then... He'll cave, and he'll say, oh, the Lord is with you. You're going to conquer. And Jeremiah doesn't change what he says. And in fact, Jeremiah asked the king, what wrong have I done? By what right have you cast me into prison? I have done nothing except preach to you the word of the Lord. Just because you don't like it doesn't give you a right to put me into the dungeons. And he says, and where are your prophets? Where are these guys who said that Nebuchadnezzar's not going to bother you? You don't have to pay him tribute. You don't have to listen to him. You can just be your own king of Judah and rebel against him. You don't have to worry. Where are they? Where, they said that Nebuchadnezzar is not going to come up against you. He's not going to bother you. He's not going to fight against us. And look at where we are now. He doesn't want it on those terms. He wants it his way. He thinks that he can be king. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it was a power trip. That it had gone to his head. And he thought that he could do this, he could fix it, and he could change Jeremiah, which is really trying to change God. But either Zedekiah didn't understand that, or he simply didn't appreciate it, didn't see the gravity of the situation. And what happens after this is the armies of Babylon besiege Jerusalem and Jerusalem is under siege for over two years and let's pick up in verse 4 of chapter 52 
It says, and in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it. So the city was besieged till the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. We'll stop right there for a moment for us to get a better understanding of what we're talking about here. If you understand the way siege warfare works, you see this is the result that the Babylonians were counting on. They lease siege to the city. No one gets in. No one goes out. Eventually, you're going to weaken them. You're going to cripple them. They run out of food. And oddly enough, eerily enough, we see pretty much the exact same thing happening in 70 AD with the Roman Empire that they laid siege to Jerusalem. When they run out of food, it's a horrific time that the people will use anything for food, including one another. History tells us this. That's just how bad things have gotten in Jerusalem. And who's to blame? Well, the people as a whole, because they wouldn't listen to God, but especially the king. He was told time and again, you better submit to Nebuchadnezzar. You better bear that yoke. If you do that, you can stay in your land. Don't rebel against him. The Lord said he would punish with the sword, with famine, with pestilence. Look at where you are now. No food for the people. And then in verse 7, let's keep going. It says, Then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled and went out from the city by night by the way of a gate between the two walls, by the king's garden while the Chaldeans were around the city. And they went in the direction of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him. And the king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and also slaughtered all the officials of Judah at Riblah. He put out the eyes of king of Zedekiah and bound him in chains, and the king of Babylon took him to Babylon and put him in prison till the day of his death. So here you are, you've been under siege for two years, and there's panic, all kinds of chaos going on in the streets because the people have no food and it's more or less all your fault. And then now a breach has been made in the wall that's finally coming to an end. They're getting in the city. And the king tries to get away with his guards. They think that they can make a run for it. Isn't it clear by now that God meant what he said? that he would punish you by the hand of the king of Babylon? Can't you see what's going on? You really think that you can escape. He wanted it on his terms. God had told him this is how it's going to be. He didn't agree. He wanted it to end differently. But we see how far he got, just to the, the plains of Jericho. He didn't get very far. His pride, that stubbornness led him to this point. We're not just him, but the entire city of Jerusalem, the entire southern kingdom of Judah came crashing down because he didn't want to listen to God. Because he thought he could have it his way. He wanted to win. He didn't want to think that he would have to submit. How many times in our lives do we stare plainly at what God is telling us? You know, we, we said this morning how blessed we are that we have his word. So easily revealed to us right here. It's simple to read, simple to understand. How many times do we look right at it and say, well, I don't know about that. And we think we know better. Or we think there's somehow an alternative that God doesn't mean what he says. That maybe we don't have to pay attention to this verse or that verse. 
because it's what we want to do. We don't want to change that. We don't want to give that up. We don't want to admit when we're wrong. It's that last one that's probably the worst of all. When we know that this is because of us. Why was Jerusalem under siege? Why were the people dying in the streets? Why were the walls eventually breached? Because of Zedekiah. Because he refused to listen. But does he own up to his mistakes? Does he, at that point, even though it's too late, does he repent? He tries to get away. He tries to escape as if there were any hope in that. We need to realize that in this life, we're not perfect, and that we are probably going to be wrong any number of times. Instead of trying to change that, trying to have everything on our terms, realize that it's not about us. That's what we see over in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, starting with verse 5. It says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. The problem is we want that time for us to be exalted. We want that to happen now. Why can't I be the best person? Why can't I have it all right now? We want that shortcut. We want it the easy way. We don't want to submit to God. You look at the prophecy, the commandments that were given to Zedekiah. What was he told? If you bear the yoke, if you submit to the king, you're going to get to stay in your land. This isn't going to last forever. The Babylonian Empire is going to be overthrown. They're going to be deposed just like any other king. You submit to him now, it's not going to last forever. But no, He wanted to be exalted. He didn't want to have to submit to another king, much less submit to God. And that's the key. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. It should be the easiest thing in the world to humble ourselves before God. It's hard to be humble when you know you're smarter than the person you're talking to. It's hard to to defer to them. When you know you have a better grasp of whatever the subject is, sports, politics, that's when it's difficult. But this is God. He's the creator of all things. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. We we can't even compare. To say that we're like insects to him is not even scratching the surface. It shouldn't be that hard for us to humble ourselves before God. But how often do we really do it? How often do we say, God's will, not my will? The kind of humility that we see Jesus having there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Versus, how many times do we cling to that pride? Are we stubborn and we say, I don't need to do that. Why should I have to? And all the other variations of that phrase. And we think we can have it our way, on our terms, and then it's all going to work out. (laughs) Even though God has told us He has all power, all authority, and His will will be done. When you think about what it means to be a Christian, we could encapsulate it by saying it's living our lives, trying to bring our will in line with God's. And it is a lifelong effort. It's something we never reach perfection on. But it's what we constantly have to try to do, to work on. And we see in the case of Zedekiah, he's infamous, going down in history as being the last king. Because he refused to listen. He had Jeremiah, he had all these other prophets telling him what he needed to do and what he needed to hear. But instead he went with what he wanted to hear. 
And so the situation went from bad to already being under the, the boot of the Babylonians to worse. So now they're all captives. And now they're all going to die in Babylon. And Jerusalem is in ruins, burned up with fire. How much did clinging on to that pride, how much did refusing to listen to God help his situation? We can't change what God has said. Whether we agree with it, whether we like it, it doesn't make any difference. It's something we have to come to terms with. That God has told us that we need to love our neighbors as ourselves, love our enemies. To be patient. It's not easy to do. But he said it. End of story. We can't change God's word. They never could in the past. It's not going to happen in the future. We need to read it, understand it, and follow it. That's our only hope. Is to place our trust in Him. Not in other people like Zedekiah did with the Egyptians, and certainly not in ourselves. We can't do anything to get rid of the sin in our lives. It all depends on God, on His grace, on the blood of Jesus. He did what we could not. We have to trust in Him. We have to place our hope in Him. And if we do that, if we believe, obey the Gospel, if we live faithfully, then we have hope of heaven. <coughs> Trusting in God, submitting to Him, it's all worth it in the end. The song we're about to sing speaks of a day that's coming where we're told we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to have to give answer for the things that we've done in this life. The question is, what will your answer be? And we only have this life to decide once it's over for us whether we die or Christ comes back whichever happens first at that point it's too late I'm sure when the walls of Jerusalem were breached a lot of people were thinking let's, let's repent let's turn to God at that point God had already decreed what was going to happen there's no stopping it there's no changing it. so while we have time and opportunity make your life right with God if you need to be baptized into Christ, into His death, do so. Wash away your sins. But if you have done so, and you need to repent of some error that's in your life, if you need the thoughts and prayers of the congregation, let us know. We'll do everything we can to help you. If you have spiritual needs this evening, why don't you come have a seat on the front while we stand. While we stand.